Good morning. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this conversation with His Excellency Mohammad Javed Zarif, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic, Islamic Republic of Iran. This is the inaugural event of a new um, EPC signature initiative, namely the EPC Talks Geopolitics. It aims to bring globally renowned speakers, including high level officials, practitioners and thought leaders for a 45 minute interactive conversation on relevant geopolitical issues. And I suppose I should have introduced myself. I'm David O'Sullivan. I'm chairman of the EPC governing board. Uh, this morning, it is a real honor to have Foreign Minister Zarif with us. Uh, Minister Zarif is a career diplomat and academic. He's been foreign minister since August of 2013. He also held a number of other important diplomatic posts, including permanent representative of Iran to the United Nations. He is an associate professor at Tehran University, uh, and he has an MA and a PhD from the University of Denver and an MA and BA from San Francisco State University. So he's very familiar with uh, Western uh, systems. He's also the author of several books and numerous articles. So welcome, Your Excellency, and thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you. We'll focus on uh, possible uh, developments in the relations between Iran and Europe, the United States, and of course, the uh, issue of the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA and in particular a possible role of the EU E3 as a bridge between US and Iran. Um, I'm going to ask the minister a few questions for the next 30 minutes in a conversational form and we will then take questions from the floor. Uh, written questions can be submitted via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and anyone wishing to intervene live, technology permitting, uh, can use the, the raise the hand function which we will uh, uh, then unmute you if, if, we, if we may. So Minister, once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to uh, just ask you to begin by telling us how you see the state of things uh, from an Iran perspective, relations with Europe, relations with the United States, uh, given where we are today. Well, it's good to be with you. And uh, let me tell you, I mean, a, bit, a brief background. Uh, we started negotiations in, uh, in 2003, actually. Uh, we had a lot of... Uh, posturing in, in between 2003 and 2012. I was involved from 2003 to 2005, and then again from uh, uh, 2013 uh, to 2015, where we agreed on, on JCPOA. We all know that it takes uh, basically give and take uh, in order to reach an agreement. You cannot reach an agreement uh, on everything that you want, uh, we certainly didn't get everything that we wanted. The Americans didn't get everything they wanted. The Europeans didn't get everything they wanted. Uh, if, if that were to be the case, one side uh, should have simply surrendered. Uh, and obviously that didn't happen. So uh, there are shortcomings in the, in the agreement from our perspective. There are shortcomings in the agreement uh, from the perspective of our uh, Western partners in, in JCPOA. But be it as it may, this is the best we could do. And I believe uh, the circumstances today uh, and the circumstances in the future will not be any better than the circumstances from 2013 to 2015. So we need to see if we can revive the deal that we have, not uh, to have ambitions of, of adding things to it. If we want to start that, I think that would be opening a Pandora's box. Uh, it took some time uh, for the Biden administration to recognize that the first order of business uh, was to just simply resurrect uh, the deal. Now, if you want to address that order of business, we need to understand what happened. Iran was following the deal. Uh, 15 reports of the IAEA, including five reports that were issued after uh, U.S. withdrew from the deal uh, and imposed uh, massive sanctions on Iran, indicate that Iran was fully compliant with the deal. On the other hand, the United States never complied with the deal. I do not want to bore you with the details, but my first letter to Federico Mogherini complaining under uh, uh, paragraph 36 of JCPOA about US behavior and paragraph 36 is a dispute resolution mechanism we incorporated in the JCPOA 
was on September 2nd, 19, 2016. That is only nine months after the start of the implementation. By that time, the United States had basically uh, took, had taken hostage the request by Airbus uh, for 117 airplanes to Iran and a lot of other things. So it was not a, an easy road from the beginning uh, on the U.S. side. Uh, and on the European side, since U.S. withdrawal, all European companies withdrew. Europe made twice commitments to us. They remained commitments. Now, my European colleagues tell us that they have been committed to JCPOA. Yes, they have been committed to JCPOA politically. They have been committed to JCPOA verbally, and we appreciate that. They were committed to JCPOA in the Security Council. They were committed to JCPOA in the General Assembly. And we won major diplomatic battles there. But when it comes to economic benefits from JCPOA, the Iranian people did not receive any economic benefits from JCPOA for the entire four years of the Trump administration. And whatever we got was during the one year window of, of Biden administration, and that was not fully within the terms of JCPOA. So the situation as we stand right now is that Iran tried to resolve this issue through the JCPOA me mechanism, did not succeed, we exhausted the mechanism, and then we started taking some measures against uh, prescribed in the JCPOA. Now, what we need to do is to remove the cause and the effect will be automatically gone. You see, there is a causal relationship here. We did not start breaking this deal. There was a deal, the United States broke it. Europe could not come to, I mean, maybe not of its own fault because European companies listen to uh, Washington more than they listen to Brussels or their own capital. Be it as it may, they, we did not receive the economic benefits. And that is why we tried to balance the situation, again, in accordance with paragraph 36. Now we want to go back. Fine, we are ready to go back immediately after the United States goes back to implementation of the deal. That's as simple as that. We don't need negotiations for that because we exactly know where we are. We exactly know what we negotiated. Everybody in the Biden administration right now, we're the ones who are sitting across the table from me. So Jake Sullivan, uh, Rob Mali, all of these people, if Wendy Sherman gets confirmed uh, by, the, by the US Senate, all of them know exactly what it takes to implement the, their part of the bargain, and we know exactly what it takes. So there is no negotiation needed unless we have ulterior agenda. And if we have ulterior agenda, we will not reach a conclusion. Well, I, I think we can all agree, uh, Minister, that from a European perspective, the JCPOA was seen as a, a, a remarkable diplomatic breakthrough, and I was a little bit associated in the margins with that, um, uh, and that the withdrawal of the Trump administration from the deal uh, dramatically changed uh, the nature of the, the dynamic in, in the way that you have described. Um, but we now have a changed situation. We have a, a new administration in Washington, as you say, uh, many of whom you know and have worked with uh, in the past. Uh, uh, we have, therefore, a window of opportunity. I, I think the, the question is going to be probably the, the synchronization of the, uh, or the choreographing of the return to uh, a better situation. Uh, what is your view of the, the EU E3 in this process? In February, you suggested that the High Representative Joseph Borrell uh, could coordinate a synchronized return to the JCPOA. Do you, do you still see that as, as one way forward? Well, I, I said choreograph. Uh, <laughs> synchronized was a slip of tongue, and I immediately corrected myself and said choreograph. Uh, and you, you were correct in saying choreograph. Uh, I think uh, it, was, it was late at night here, Tehran time, and uh, English not being my mother tongue, uh, I, I had to correct myself. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honest confession. Uh, but I said choreograph, and we, we are ready for Joseph Borrell uh, working that choreograph uh, methodology. Uh, and uh, uh, it is clear. It is exactly known what the U.S. needs to take. There are sanctions in JCPOA that Trump restored. There are new sanctions that he uh, leveled against Iran. And there are redesignations that Trump did during his uh, four year of disaster. 
for, for the international community. Now, what we need to do is to have a clean return. The United States returns to implementation of its commitments, that is to normalize Iran's economic relations through removing all these sanctions, imposed, reimposed, or related. We will know exactly what we need to do, and we have a basically an impartial uh, body, the IAEA, that will verify whatever we do. Uh, if the United States takes its measures and uh, do, does it in a way that can be verifiable, and then we will take our measures. The EU can play a very important role. I hope the E3 and EU also understand that here, the culprit is the United States, not Iran. We did not do anything to deserve Trump. If anybody did anything to deserve Trump, it was the American people who voted for him. We in Iran didn't do anything to bring Trump to power. He came to power in a democratic way, whatever they wanted to do. The responsibility of the wrongs committed by Trump does not lie on Iran. If there is a new situation, and I'm very happy that you say there is a new situation because I haven't seen any indication of it yet, but if there is a new situation, then we need to see action from the United States. The, up until now, this administration has done nothing different from the Trump administration. Even, you know, we have close to $10 million, billion sitting in Korea. Money is sitting in Iraq. We are selling Iraq gas and electricity. And U.S. has permitted Iraq to buy gas and electricity. But the U.S. doesn't permit Iraq to give us the money, as if we are, they give us the permission to donate to Iraq gas and electricity. And we need that money very badly for corona, for the vaccine, for uh, food and medicine for our people. And the United States, the Trump administration, Secretary Blinken boasted that they prevented Korea from sending to a Swiss channel established by Trump. Don't forget that. The Swiss channel was not established by Iran. It was established by Trump to sell this propaganda that they have opened humanitarian uh, trade with Iran, which they never did. So Korea wanted to send this money to, to the Swiss channel, $1 billion of our, uh, about a fraction of, of what they owe us. And Secretary Blinken boasts that we prevented it. That is, he's boasting about preventing Iran from buying food and medicine for its own population, with its own money. Now, if you consider this a change of policy, then I'll be happy to hear it. Well, I think we all understand that the, the new administration, uh, you know the system well, uh, Your Excellency, uh, in America, it takes some time for a new administration to bed down. I think the, the answer one most often gets from Washington these days is the policy is under review. Um, but behind the scenes, I think it is clear that there is a, a new willingness on the part of this administration to re-engage uh, in ways which was not possible with the previous administration. Um, in, in the past, I, I just reread or read um, Bill Burns' uh, memoirs, the um, back channel, uh, th there were some back channel contacts. Do you, do you think that might be a way of, of getting to a point where both sides would feel comfortable uh, returning to a more formal uh, engagement around a table? Well, unfortunately, I mean, uh, with all due respect to Bill Benz, those back channel contacts were in order to start an open dialogue. And we did start an open dialogue. And we did finalize an open dialogue. Probably Bill Burns and I and John Kerry and I met each other more than we ever liked to meet each other. Uh, not that they are unpleasant people, but uh, we were on the two sides of a very difficult hostility for, for, for some three to four decades. But we met, we did negotiate, we reached a deal. Now, the Trump administration considered it the worst deal of the century. Fine, the Trump administration is gone. You believe this was a good deal. This administration, the people of this administration believe this was a good deal. Why are they talking? Why is Wendy Sherman saying that 2015 is not 2021? By the same token, 1945 is not 2021, so let's abandon the veto. What are we talking about? I mean, uh, Wendy Sherman negotiated this text. She knows there is no 
comma in the text that can be changed. She knows that every single word and comma was negotiated. So why are they talking about renegotiating? Why are they talking about adjusting? Why are they talking about issues that we already dealt with in this, in this day? And Iran paid the price for it. So they need to abandon that policy. As I said, once the United States com comes back to the room, because there was a room, the United States tried to torpedo that room, but Iran and the Europeans and Russia and China maintain that room. Of course, we uh, paid the heaviest price. Uh, uh, about 1,600 sanctions. China paid the price, about 120 sanctions. Russia paid the price in tens of sanctions. Europe, how many sanctions? Five, six? So we maintain this room. So we don't need to use back channels again. We have a room, we established a room, we established its parameters, we established its rules. The United States simply needs to buy the ticket to come back to the room, that's all. And it is, it is if I understand you then, uh, Minister, that uh, the, this, the point of departure of getting people back into the room is that everyone, including Iran, returns immediately to full compliance. Yes, in the order that they left. Uh, Isn't that fair? You see, we're not, we're not asking anything out of the ordinary. We were the first one to come to compliance from July to January, July 2015 to January 2016. Iran took all the steps to come to compliance. On January 16th, 2016, the IAEA confirmed that Iran had done everything. It was then the United States that took steps. So the order was reversed. Now, it is the United States that has left. It is the United States that violated. So based on the very logic of JCPOA, it is the United States that needs to come to compliance. We need to verify it, and we will take our steps immediately. That's as simple as that. I mean, maybe, you see, let me tell you something. Europeans are used to compromise. Iran and the United States are not. The Americans are used to imposing, and we are used to resisting. So in our politics and their politics, this is abnormal. And that is why I've been under so much pressure, and I know the Biden administration is under pressure, as was the Obama administration. So we are doing something that is politically abnormal vis-a-vis -vis each other. They always imposed on Iran and we always resisted them. This was the only time that we reached an understanding. Now, if they want to go back to the imposition mood, then we will go back to the resisting mood. As simple as that. So either compromise or back to our old habits. You mentioned um, politics and, and, and uh, uh, elections a few moments ago, Minister. The Americans have had their election. You have one coming up uh, in, in June. Uh, will this play into the, 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 the margin of maneuver on the, the Iranian side? Well, uh, you know, foreign policy in Iran is above politics. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm simply telling you what is in the textbooks, not in, in the outside reality. But, but, uh, but uh, in, uh, in seriousness, uh, uh, our policy on the nuclear issue uh, is being set by consensus uh, at the highest level. And we all participate in, in, that, in that process. It's a time-consuming process. Uh, it's not uh, a decree that leads to a policy. It has to be uh, based on consensus. And consensus is built based on various actors' perception of the views of the people. It, it's not, uh, I mean, no, none of us works in a vacuum. All of us work within the context of our polities. Uh, the Americans have their own polity, but the Americans always assume that they're the only ones with, 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 a, with a polity. They, they don't understand that other countries also have their own uh, systems, their own uh, mechanisms, their own consensus building uh, situation. But, there is a time constraint, and that is, once we go into, into our elections, it will be a lame duck government. 
and a Lenga government will not be able to do anything serious. And then we will have a waiting period of almost six months. We will not have a new government before September. A lot of things can happen um, between now and September. So it is advisable for the United States to move fast. And moving fast only requires them uh, not to be shy, just to take the measures that, we, that they need to take. They will take these measures either today or six months from now. It's much better to take it now. Thank you. Um, one question which uh, I think puzzles people sometimes, uh, Minister, is uh, Iran has always said that actually you don't want to acquire uh, any, any military nuclear capabilities. Uh, but in moving away from, from full compliance with the JCPOA for the reasons that you've very ably described, uh, you have increased the enrichment of uranium way beyond what it would be needed in, most, in the views of most people for purely uh, civil purposes. Why, 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 has, why is Iran seeking to have this high level of enrichment, uh, which is more than would be needed for strictly civil purposes? Well, uh, first of all, uh, strictly civilian purposes may even require us to produce 90% uh, enriched uranium. Because uh, if, if, if you remember the Tehran nuclear reactor that was built uh, under the Atoms for Peace uh, program of General Eisenhower, uh, in the in the 1950s, uh, used uh, over 90 percent uh, uranium grade. Uh, now uh, we changed it in the 1990s to 20 percent. It can easily go back to the original uh, design, which is much better for producing uh, radioisotopes. So it's not that uh, we don't need it, but again, you should not put the cause and effect separately. The effect does not come before the cause. The cause explains the effect. The effect doesn't explain itself. So I don't need to explain why we're producing 20% uh, or, or higher, because something caused it. We were not producing 20%. Now, we don't want nuclear weapons. We believe ideologically as well as strategically that nuclear weapons cannot be used, and that is a waste of money, and we should not engage in it. And we've said that, and our record in not using chemical weapons when the Iraqis were using chemical weapons is perfect. And the OPCW has checked our record time and again, and we have come out, uh, I mean, uh, very clean from all these reviews in spite of all the pressures from the United States. Our record on the nuclear issue is also clear. We will never develop nuclear weapons. But if you move the cause, the effects will move. If you do not move the cause, then don't expect the effect to simply go away. It's illogical, irrational. No, I think, I, so it's, it's clear that the, the, the full restoration of the, the JCPOA in, in, its, in, its, in its full form is, is, is the objective we should all be, be working for. Um, assuming we, we were able to do that, Minister, <clears throat> Uh, how would you feel then about discussing some of the other issues which have been, been raised? You were, you were clear to say that you didn't want these mixed with the JCPOA in the first phase, but imagine that we, we do return to full compliance and full functioning of the JCPOA. Um, how then could we take forward some of the discussions on, on some of the other issues, as you know, uh, the issue of missiles or uh, uh, human rights or, or um, the regional situation? Uh, do you think it would be possible then to have a, a, a new discussion uh, it, to take, uh, take account of, of those issues and how they might be progressed? Well, uh, let's take one step at a time. First of all, JCPOA is a fully negotiated document. It dealt with the issue of timelines, the so-called sunset. It was the subject of the, probably the longest period of negotiations from day one when uh, Jake Solomon and Bill Burns uh, and Puneet Talwar met with my colleagues from the, from the former Iranian administration in, in Muscat until the very last day of the negotiations, we were discussing timelines. So timelines, have already been discussed. The United States wanted more, we wanted less, we agreed for the middle. 
Then the United States cannot come back and say, I have, uh, I want my cake and eat it too, or what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable. That doesn't work with Iran. Second, missiles. Missiles, uh, according to uh, the UN resolution, are supposed to be missiles designed to be capable of nuclear weapons. We do not have nuclear weapons. We do not intend to have nuclear weapons. So as Wendy Sherman said before the Senate in 2015, if the issue of nuclear weapons is resolved, then the issue of, uh, uh, of missiles will be automatically resolved. Uh, and we paid the price. We agreed to eight years of restrictions on, uh, that, that the United Nations is imposing. We didn't agree, but they imposed it anyway. So that, that's the situation. Regional issue. We were prepared to discuss regional issues, but believe me, the United States and Europe had to do much more. Are they prepared to stop selling so much weapons to our region? This region has become a basically a, a powder cake of, of, of missiles, largest inventory of global weapons in this, in this region, largest buyers of weapons. Is Europe prepared to stop selling Saudi Arabia arms? Saudi Arabia last year spent $67 billion on arms. Iran spent altogether $10 billion on its military. And I'm using Cypri uh, numbers. So who is supposed to talk about the region? Are we, are we in Libya? Are we in Somalia? Are we in Sudan? Who is in all these places where there is trouble? And you talk about Yemen, we presented a negotiated solution for Yemen. The United States agreed, but MBS believed at that time that, we, that they could win Yemen in three weeks. It's taken six years. We, we, we're commemorating the six years of, of Saudi aggression against Yemen. So are we, are we going to talk about everything in the region or just what they want to talk about in the region? We discussed all of those issues. We had shouting matches during uh, JCPOA negotiations, and we decided that this was the best we could do. Now, the leader in Iran said that this is a test for the United States. If the United States passes this test, then we can move to other issues. But you know that the United States failed. You know that for four years, our people have been under uh, an economic war. I'm using President Trump's word. My word is economic terrorism. But President Trump's word is economic war. They put sanctions on anybody who worked with Iran, not just punishing us, but punishing Europe, punishing Russia, punishing China, punishing our neighbors. So the United States did not pass that uh, test. In fact, the United States paid miserably. We passed the test. We have 15 IAEA reports, as John Kerry would say, under our belt. So let's put, uh, let's get something under the belt of the United States, some good record, some good faith, and then come back and talk about it. And then it will be the next administration in Iran. And my successor will discuss that uh, probably with you. Okay. <clears throat> and I think that's very clear. Um... I think we have some questions from the audience now. We're just reaching 9.30. Uh, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, I think uh, Terry Schultz from Deutsche Welle wants to put a question as the technology. No. Or is it, is it first Nicholas, Nicholas White from APCO? I'm here. Okay, Nicholas, can you, can you introduce yourself and, and, and put your question, please? Thank you, David. Uh, Minister, my name is Nicholas White. I work as a consultant at APCO Worldwide in Brussels. Um, I used to work with Rob Malley uh, at the International Crisis Group, but I think you will see more of him than I do at the moment. Um, my question, you mentioned briefly in passing the Yemen situation, and I'd just like you to expand on that a bit, please. I think we're seeing a new dynamic in what's happening in Yemen at the moment. Um, the, the situation on the ground is changing. The situation in other capitals is changing. So I'd be very interested to know if you see uh, prospects for 
a, a resolution in the near nearer rather than further future and what role you think that your country would play in that if you have time i'd also be interested to hear your reflections on the the gulf states and the relationship between qatar and its neighbors as well uh, but yemen is what i'm particularly interested in hearing about well uh, the situation in yemen should only be be determined by the people of yemen and that was in our plan ceasefire humanitarian assistance uh, inclusive dialogue and an inclusive government uh, in, in, in Yemen. So this, this was uh, our plan six years ago. Uh, it can be our, anybody's plan now. Now, uh, as, as you pointed out, there is uh, serious fighting going on in Marib, uh, and uh, the Saudis want to stop that without doing what is necessary uh, to have, have an agreement. As, as you know, Martin Griffith suggested uh, simultaneous uh, cessation of hostilities and uh, removal of the siege. Now, they simply want cessation of hostilities to be followed uh, at a certain date by removal of the siege under certain conditions, which do not differ really from now. That is, the, uh, that is what I hear uh, the U.S. proposal is. Uh, and, and the Yemenis have not accepted that. Uh, they have not accepted it when they had uh, more serious difficulties and they will not accept it now. Uh, but if there is a serious proposal on the table, uh, as, as we thought Martin Griffith was working on, uh, I think uh, there is a chance for, for peace in Yemen, and at least for a ceasefire, uh, removal of the siege, simultaneous ceasefire and removal of the siege and immediate negotiations uh, between the Yemenis uh, for, for a future solution. Um, and I believe that future solution should be friendly to all uh, Yemen's neighbor, uh, neighbors, including uh, in particular uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman and UAE and, and, and Iran as a, as a major player in the region. Now, uh, as far as the, the situation in the Persian Gulf, uh, again, you have seen uh, that uh, the, the, the countries that have created uh, trouble in the region uh, are again, uh, were the ones that created trouble even for their own ally, Qatar. I mean, we did not put a siege on Qatar. We did not put a siege on anybody. We actually rushed to support Qatar, which were on the opposite side with, with Iran during the Syria uh, conflict and are on the opposite side with Iran. But we believe that this is not the way to resolve uh, regional issues. We're happy uh, that they have an accommodation. Uh, and we are uh, prepared to have an accommodation with, with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, with Bahrain, with all uh, Persian Gulf countries. Our proposal is for all Persian Gulf countries, that is Iran and Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, and UAE and Oman, to sit together and work out a future. We put a proposal for that future that is called HOPE, for most peace endeavor. Uh, President Rouhani presented it to the General Assembly in 2019, and I presented the details of that plan to a meeting of the Security Council uh, in, uh, in the basically the same day. So, and I reiterated that plan in a ministerial meeting of the Security Council in, in I think it was October 2020. Uh, so we are prepared. Uh, I think it's up to our uh, neighbors in the region to participate and up to uh, their allies uh, in the West to encourage them. Because uh, I don't see any encouragement. Uh, I see basically a blank check. Now, uh, the, 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 the initial measure, uh, statements by the, Trump, by the Biden administration uh, about Yemen, about Saudi Arabia, not positive, but a major step forward from what uh, Trump used to do. So because, because, because Trump uh, basically outsourced his uh, regional policy uh, to Saudi Arabia and Israel, and I see uh, that may change. And that change is a welcome change. Thank you, Minister. Um, now I see Terry Schultz, I think, is, is there. Uh, Terry, would you like to ask your question, please? Hi, yes. Can you hear me now, David? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Minister. Um, I, I don't want to be overly simplistic. I've also covered this for many years and understand the complexities of it. But I just, I just want to find out what would have been the harm with sitting down for the talks that the European Union asked for? I mean, what really, what is the reason not to sit down and have talks with no 
uh, without presuming in advance that you agree to anything. Um, and what would you see the Europeans doing m more? Um, Amanda herself has just written an article saying the EU needs to not just be sitting on the sidelines. Is that how you see the EU, even though it is the mediator of the deal? What would you like to see the Europeans do? And what is stopping you from sitting down and having just preliminary talks? Thank you. With the US. Uh, uh, I think that's a pertinent question. It's, it's a fair question. Uh, the problem is uh, nothing takes place in, in a vacuum. Uh, we are hearing what comes from the United States and, 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 some, and, and even some of the E3. What comes from the United States and, and some of the E3 are that they are interested in talking about uh, sunset, they're interested in talking about missiles, we, we hear that they're interested in talking about other issues. All of these issues have been addressed in JCPOA already and have been dealt with. So these are not issues for talks, uh, and if these are not issues for talks, what are the talks for? We know exactly what we need to do, we know exactly what the United States needs to do. So, at, uh, on the one hand, we don't see any reason for talks. We can immediately go to, to implementation and then have talks. We don't have any problem when, I mean, up until April 2018, we met with the Americans. Uh, Brian Hook, who represented the United States, uh, Rob Malley's uh, predecessor, uh, uh, met with my colleagues uh, on the sidelines of the, uh, of the Joint Commission meetings. Uh, but, but now the United States is out there to leave. As soon as it comes back with implementing its, ob uh, its obligations, uh, there can be talks within, within uh, P5 plus one. Um, so we see no reason. And on the other hand, we see every indication about the subject that the United States has said it wants to raise. That is uh, timetable or, or the sunset. I don't believe in sunset. I believe there are time frame. And the Security Council Resolution 2231 says implementation of the measures within the time frame. So that's a, that's a Security Council resolution decision. But they want to talk about it. They, based on uh, this, this concept of what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable. Th this, this will not work with Iran. So why should we talk? I need, I need to have a reason. And I need to be, ex be, be able to explain to a uh, leadership to our parliament, which already passed a, a legislation and we are bound by law to, uh, to follow that legislation, I need to be able to, uh, to explain to them what I need to talk about. I don't have any answer. The only answer that comes to their mind is that the Americans are insisting on the talks because they want to raise all those uh, extraneous issues. That's the problem. And I believe the E3 will be well advised to understand that there are participants in JCPOA and there are non-participants in JCPOA. And the United States, last I check, is not a participant. So they should coordinate their positions if they consider themselves members of JCPOA within the participants before they go and issue common declarations with the United States. They cannot, I mean, if they want to forget history so fast, Certainly, we, Russia, and China are not prepared to forget history so rapidly. Yes, well, <clears throat> this, this issue of choreography, Minister, is clearly going to uh, engage uh, people's minds uh, in, 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 the, in the coming days and weeks. Um, I have a question here from uh, Anno Colombo uh, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, who asks you, would like to ask you whether um, Iran <clears throat> has a strategy of reaching out bilaterally to other countries in Europe beyond the E3, recognizing that there is the E3 and then there is the EU uh, with, of course, 24 other countries uh, and whether you are, you think it's, it's useful or whether you are actively talking to other members, uh, other member countries of, of, the, of the European Union. Oh, we have extremely good relations with all members of the European Union and we continue our conversations with them, unfortunately, because of COVID, our, uh, uh, I mean, mutual visits uh, have been suspended for, for the last one year, but we are in close touch with uh, others uh, in, in the EU. We just had uh, Foreign Minister of Ireland uh, here in Iran. I'm, I'm in good communication with a good number of uh, uh, members of the European Union 
uh, on, a, on a regular base, basis, both uh, the Nordic countries, Southern European countries, um, uh, others. I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is our policy, and we believe they have a major role to play. And they have played a major role uh, in, uh, in moving the process forward. There are some uh, members of the EU who have very long historical ties with Iran, some of the E3, but as well some of the other members of the EU. Thank you. We're, we're almost out of time, Minister. Um, <clears throat> and I, would, I, I want to end on an optimistic note, but uh, let, me, let me get there by maybe <clears throat> asking the, the, the slightly less optimistic question. Uh, imagine what we've talked about doesn't work and we are not able for whatever reason to put the, the JCPOA back together in the way that most of us, I think, would like to see happen. Um, what is plan B? What, what, would, what would then happen? How would Iran react and, and how would you cope with the, the continued impact of sanctions and the difficulties which is, and hardships which this is causing for your country and, and your people? Uh, you see, we diplomats always do the right thing after we've tested all the wrong options. So, and I had thought that in 2013, having tested all the wrong options, we were coming to the right uh, way. Um, unfortunately, I was proven wrong again. I've been proven wrong many times, and this was another time I was proven wrong. But I, I believe what is important from an Iranian perspective is that we cannot make our economy conditional. We need to have serious confidence and trust in the ability of Europe and the United States to stick to their commitments. Otherwise, we have learned, I mean, this was a very harsh lesson, but we have learned how to insulate our economy from oil, how to immunize ourselves from the impact of uh, foreign coercion. And uh, we know uh, the tactics that Richard Nephew, uh, now uh, deputy to Rob Mali, uh, spelled out in his book, that after a period of sanctions, the US has a plan to give a time of relief so that sanctions would have a bite again. We won't allow that to happen. The United States has to come clean. We will not play with the future of our nation. U.S. needs to come clean. U.S. cannot play with us. We are serious negotiators. But when we agree to something, we stick to it. And we have shown that. We have an agreement. I can tell you one thing. This administration, the next administration, will not be able to do a better deal with Iran. Not with this government, not with any future government. This was the best deal possible. I know that as somebody who has dealt with this, with this particular issue for two decades and has dealt with US-Iranian relations for four decades. So I understand what I'm talking about. And I believe this is the best possible deal. It's not a perfect deal. No deal is perfect, but you can't do any better, and we can't do any better. Well, on, on, on that note, uh, Minister, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. I think this has been a very uh, uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I, I, I can testify from my personal experience in the margins of the fact that it, at times it, thought, it was thought that the JCPOA itself was an impossible achievement, uh, and it happened. So I can only hope that the same determination and hard work of, of people like yourselves, but also all members of the, of the uh, uh, P5 plus one uh, can, can, can do that trick again with hopefully a more open-minded administration in Washington than we saw in the, in the, in the past four years. It's going to be a challenge, uh, a, a real challenge of diplomacy and, and international politics, but uh, Personally, I would remain confident that it, it should be possible. Uh, and we certainly wish you uh, uh, every success and luck in, in, in contributing to that. And I want to thank you once again for joining us today. 
uh, and inaugurating this new series uh, of uh, the EPC Talks Geopolitics. And we couldn't have had, I think, a, a better illustration of what we hope to do uh, in, in coming events. So thank you very much, Minister, and thank you to all our participants. Thank you.